Hey, mighty one, Adriana here letting you know that a new round of my live online birth preparation class series starts May 2nd. That's just around the corner. If you want to know exactly how to support the physical, mental, and emotional aspects of birth and work with your body so you can have a more flowing labor, then you should come and join me. We'll also talk about how to support the process if you have an induction, get an epidural, or require a cesarean so you'll feel prepared no matter what. Go to birthfulcourses.com to learn more and sign up today. Welcome to Birthful Mighty Parent or Parent-to-Be. I'm Adriana Lozada. Anytime you engage with a system, can you look and analyze that system and demand that system to treat you like a whole, full human being? That's midwife and researcher Dr. Mimi Niles, who is also my guest for today's episode. Mimi's work seeks to improve the perinatal experience for all people and focuses on addressing the complex systemic issues in perinatal care. Now, given that this episode is part of our series on models and places of birth and that most births in the U.S. happen in a hospital, Mimi is the perfect person to talk about what it means to give birth within that system. She and I will also be talking about how your goals as a birthing person might be at odds with the goals of the hospital and what you can do about it. And to be honest, at points, this is not an easy breezy conversation because the system is filled with what can seem like unsurmountable complexities. At the same time, if you're birthing in a hospital, it is really important for you to know what you're up against ahead of time so that you can prepare and set things up to have a better birth experience. Now, this isn't to say that you can't have a dream birth at a hospital. In fact, in our next episode with Jenny Murphy, she shares how she did just that. And I also have a condensed episode for you titled How to Have a Great Hospital Birth to further help with your preparation. You're listening to Birthful, here to inform your intuition. Why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and also how you identify Sure. So I'm Mimi Niles. My pronouns are she and her. And I identify as a midwife. Uh, I identify as a mother doing mothering and parenting work as an immigrant brown woman. That's the body that I live in. And as an engaged Buddhist, um, which is trying to bring my spiritual practice and my social justice practice in conversation with each other. I'm fascinated by that because, especially how it ties us to our conversation, but first, say I am a pregnant person giving birth at a hospital. What do I need to understand about how that system works and how I fit into that system? That is like a trillion dollar question, I think, because and I'm, I'm a researcher as well, which is sort of a new identity. Uh, and, and that's one of my, I feel, guiding research questions is, is trying to understand this system, right? Uh, although I will say it's not a monolithic system. So it really is dependent on your location and your geography and your state down to the very granular of your town or village or city. And then even within that city, I happen to be in New York City which has the largest public health care network in the country. So I'm trying to understand a very big system that is basically a conglomeration of public hospitals, public health clinics, school health clinics, family health clinics, federally qualified health clinics. So it really depends on what system you're seeking out your care in. But in the U.S., that's actually one of the problems and challenges of the U.S. is that you cannot speak about a system because there's there's multiple systems happening at the same time and they're functioning in either for-profit models or public models or hybrid models. So I don't have an easy answer for that, um, but I think it is worth people or users investigating what systems they have access to and what services are offered in those systems and how their insurance impacts very clearly what choices they have and what they have access to, particularly in perinatal care or maternity care. So you brought up a great point about insurance companies and the insurance system, which when you're thinking, I'm going to go give birth in a hospital, you're probably not thinking about how 
the way insurance works with the hospital specifically or with the care provider specifically, how that ties in to the care you will receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unfortunately it's a fee for service model. Um, it's an incent. It's an incentivized system. It incentivizes volume over quality, and that is sort of the basic tension of maternity care in the U.S., particularly around midwifery care, because the midwifery model of care is about intervening less. It's about supporting a physiologic process. It's about supporting the whole change over time, right? Which is what to me, pregnancy is and labor is and birth is and parenting is, it's really change over time. And so models of payment are not structured for sort of the long-term gains of a particular care model. They're really structured around you do a service, you get a fee. And that incentivizes you know, intervention. It incentivizes a more sort of what we call a technocratic model of care where the technology is what's driving the care. The intervention is what's driving the care. And that, as we're seeing, does not work in maternity care because in essence, it's a physiologic process that really needs protection, guidance, a safe space. It doesn't mean that complications cannot arise. They do either in, you know, in the prenatal period or in labor or postpartum. And that's when you do need uh, specialists, or you need intervention, or you need somebody with a skill set, right? Sort of a technician who can help you address that. But that is not the case for most people. So, what would be a model of payment that is more structured around supporting the long term change over time process that you mentioned? I work in a system where the midwives in the practice, and we're public practice. We're not privately paid. We don't get paid per birth. I get a salary. So some people call that the laborist model. So basically you go in, you do your hours, you get paid for the work you do. And there are some studies to show that actually the quality improves in that type of model because the provider is not engaging directly with trying to, you know, build their bottom line. Basically, they're coming in and doing good work for 12 hours or 18 hours, and then they go home and they get a, they get their paycheck. So in my practice, for example, all the 90% of the vaginal births are with midwives. So the, the risk condition doesn't matter. You could have preeclampsia. You could have gestational diabetes. You could have both. You could have three things, four things. You're still, if it's a vaginal birth, it's going to be at the hands of a midwife. So I really am trying to also get the midwifery world and the clinical world and the health services world to think about midwifery care as more expansive because we've, we've always been sort of pigeoned into this low risk, low risk model. And I think that has a lot to do with sort of the hierarchies of care and how care is structured. But midwives can actually do good birth no matter what the circumstance is because birth is a process for anyone. And so it's really about who's there to contain and support and to guide that process um, and can insurers and hospital systems realize that this is what the client values versus what the system values, which is something very, very different, right? The system values efficiency and the system values bottom lines and, you know, not being in the red and all those kinds of things. When a, when a person, a human pregnant person goes into the hospital, I don't think they're thinking about all of those things, you know, like what's going to make my hospital more money or what's going to make my provider more money? They're not thinking about those things. They're thinking about who's going to make me feel seen and where am I going to feel cared for and who's going to give me and show me respect and my partner and my family and my other children and who's going to respect that I work nine to five and I can't take a day off every time I have to go for a clinic visit. Well, and I think that's a great point in that there are two different focuses, right? Like as a person giving birth, you are focused on the compassionate, equitable, dignified care that you mentioned, and also person-centered. And I would think when I envision my utopia of care, it would even be person-led care. Mm -hmm. But the, how that is so at odds with what the hospital system that you are stepping into to give birth has as their priorities. And we have lots of ways to measure whether an intervention is, quote unquote, needed or was done well or 
you know, did his purpose. But we don't have things embedded into the system that measure whether the person is feeling seen, whether they're feeling heard, whether there's trust. So how do I want to jump ahead and say, how do we change that? Because we know like that's something that a person is going to experience when they go in. Yeah, I mean, that is also the million dollar question, because I, I think it goes way, way back and it goes into how these institutions were designed and erected and what the purpose of those institutions was. Um, And I think we're in a moment of deep, deep rupture and reckoning in the U.S. And you cannot and should not (laughs) be given a literally given a microphone about maternity care in the U.S. and not talk about the absolute disrespect that has been laid to bear on the on Black women, Indigenous women, women of color, immigrant women, refugee women. What we're seeing right now is, you know, the news reports of forced sterilization. I mean, this is not new for those of us who have been in the work. This has been happening since the birth of this country, since since the colonization of this country. A, a, a woman's womb has been a commodity, it's a place to make money. It's a place to produce workers. It's a place to increase your investment, grow your wealth. Um, or it's been a place of control, right? It's a place to, for people to say, you're having too many babies. We're going to tie your tubes and we're not, we're not going to tell you about it because you're burdening our system, right? A system that really was never created to take care of poor people, to take care of people of color, to take care of immigrant people, to take care of people who built this country, the more I learn, the more I think these systems were actually built to keep people out, to keep sh- people shut out of places of power, p- places of control. You know, for example, in midwifery, only 2% of midwives identify as midwives of color. That is not reflective of who we are as a country. Of OBs, I think it's something like 8% of OBs um, identify as Black. So I think the, it's more than just the episode of care. It's all the pipelines that come into care, insurance, public health infrastructure, the workforce pipeline, the nursing education, medical education. It is just an absolute maze of what has been created to exclude people. And now we're at a point where particularly public health systems, because that's my interest, where the predominant people who are going into that care are marginalized and minoritized people. And we're trying to use the same systems that were used to exclude them. And so what ends up happening is people come out of that system broken and hurt and harmed. And then we scratch our heads and we wonder why, you know? Um, So I'm particularly interested in, and this is like, I'm just being unapologetic here, but the full on integration of midwifery care into maternity care systems, because they're not accessible in the U.S. We represent about 10 to 12 percent of all births in the United States. If you want to talk about community birth and I'm talking about home birth or birth center birth, that's even less. It's hovering around, I think, 1.5, 1.8 percent. Is Medicaid paying for it? Are insurers paying for it? For the most part, back to that insurance question, no, they're not going to, they're not paying for home birth at the same rate. So the home birth midwives are fighting to get, they do a birth and they have to fight to get paid for that birth, you know, or they have inequitable Medicaid reimbursement. So they're, they're disincentivized from taking on clients who have Medicaid because Medicaid pays so little that there's no way to run a business to, and take Medicaid only, you know, clients. At every point of the discussion that we're having, at every point we find barriers of access, barriers of access determined by the system, determined by the power plays, determined by the hierarchy within the system. And I also want to talk about that because I know, I know. I definitely know the power of midwives and how the midwifery model of care compared to a technocratic model of care makes a huge difference in these outcomes of feeling you have a a better experience, not just that at the moment that you left the hospital, you and your baby were healthy. But what I think doesn't get talked about as much is also all the other players and how they structure and how that hierarchy, that power structure system that you talked about gets perpetuated for the people and and, and violently so for the people that 
are in the system trying to provide care. And so we have, you know, OBs and midwives and nurses and then the nurse manager and the in the administration and then in terms of the the doctors themselves you have residents and whether they're first year or second year or third year or they're fellow of their students like that's a lot of can you untangle that web a little bit for us <laughs> oh uh i can try <laughs> um i've been in clinical practice for going on 16 years and I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> and I, I would say I work in a, in a system that, um, and my research too, when I did my initial research on midwifery care in the public setting, I specifically chose midwifery practices that didn't have residents because I felt like that was a variable that I couldn't control at all. And I really wanted to see what care look like with that trifecta of physician, midwife, nurse, right? So I can speak a little bit about residents, but in my own clinical practice, I have not worked with residents very often. Um, but residents are basically physicians in training, right? They finished medical school. They're going for their, um, I would call it an, almost an apprenticeship. That's how midwives are also trained. We're trained in a very apprentice model. We sort of shadow a midwife and we do everything that they do. And, and that's, you learn by doing. Um, and I think the way that power is organized in healthcare is pretty clear. I'm just going to say it, but it's the physician is on top and everybody else is on the bottom. So I wouldn't even call it a pyramid. It's sort of like, maybe it's a pyramid, but on the top are the MDs. They make the decisions. They're also on the top of, they're the insurance company CEOs and they're the managed care plan CEOs. And they're the, you know, so it's not just hospitals, you know, it's not some person sitting in the corner office. It's every decision that's made, the who gets licensed in the system and who works in the system and who gets credentialed and who gets hired as the administrators in the system. It's very, very physician heavy and physician centric. Really, so when people say person-centered, the opposite of person-centered is, I say the opposite is physician-centered. You know, and that really is how the model runs: is um, consolidated power by the physician. And in some ways, there's the, the justification is well, we have the training and we have the knowledge, and this is the work that this is our space where we do the work. But it's not because, like for example, when I think of obstetrics. And I really, when people say I work in obstetrics, I say, I don't work in obstetrics. I, I work in midwifery or I work in maternity, right? Obstetrics is designed to, as it should be, is a surgical technocratic specialty. They are surgeons. That's what they are, right? And that's and that's the knowledge they have. They that's have the, the knowledge of that. surgery, yes. which is- which We is, want it. We need yeah, it, you know. When when we need it, right? Yeah. When we need it, we're so happy that they're there to provide that. Um, when things get get pathologized or pathology shows up, then you need them. But we know that in birth, that's not usually the norm. Birth yeah. is not pathologized. And so when you say about like them holding the knowledge and so they're it's clinician centered because they hold the knowledge. Well, they hold the knowledge to a very specific thing that we are prioritizing, but is in fact in dire opposition of what birth needs, mm. which is bringing it back to that mindfulness that you so center because it's you need oxytocin to flow. And for yeah. oxytocin to flow, you need to not feel fear. You need to be safe, protected, love, treated as, with respect, seen you know, treated with dignity, all these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have physician collaborators and that's how it should be. And, and, and I want to go back to that idea of can other forms of knowledge be honored and respected in this space? Right now, I feel like it's very hard for the medical model to consider and regard and welcome, because that would be the ultimate to welcome in other forms of knowledge, right? Because midwifery, 
is an ancient, ancient, ancient tradition and practice that has been central to every community since we were commu- since we were human communities. Um, it has lost its way because of power and because of politics and because of capitalism. It has so lost its way in the United States, and we are we are driven. Capitalism is what drives this country. You know, if you cannot see that now, then I don't know when you're going to see that. Like, you can pay for the best kind of care that you want to have. Um, But what about the people who have public insurance or regular insurance, who are working people like me, who I can't afford an $8,000 out-of-pocket cost right now, you know? And so I think, again, so many systems were designed to consolidate power And if knowledge is power, then you also try to consolidate what knowledge means, right? And so those are randomized controlled trials and evidence-based medicine and all that kind of lingo and jargon that you hear, to me, is all a power play as well. Because the knowledge the person I'm taking care of has about their own body and their own family system and their own culture and their community and their resource, that is valuable knowledge. And the knowledge I bring as, as a a practicing midwife who's done hundreds and hundreds of births, when I just know that everything's okay, even though the tracing might be off or the contractions aren't strong enough, but I know because there's so many changes, I'm micro changes I'm watching and observing in this person I'm taking care of that I know that their body is transitioning. You know, I can't prove it to you on the monitor, but I know because I've had so much lived embodied experience but it doesn't count for anything. Because where do I put that in the chart? Where do I put that in the medical record? Did you know that one in eight couples struggle with fertility or that the risk of miscarriage is sadly more common than breast cancer or diabetes? We don't talk enough about the different fertility challenges that you may be facing. The journey can be expensive, mystifying, and full of disappointment and even shame. On the new podcast, Baby or Bust, host Dr. Laura Shaheen, an OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist, answers your questions, dispels the myths, and hopefully transforms disappointment into hope. Every episode of Baby or Bust features interviews with experts and real-life infertility survivors to explore answers to questions like, does pineapple help with embryo implantation? And what really causes a miscarriage? Join Dr. Shaheen each week for practical approaches for your fertility journey. You are not alone, really. Find Baby or Bust on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I get it. By the end of the day, the last decision you want to worry about is what's for dinner. So how about you let Home Chef bring simple, delicious meals right to your door? Home Chef has 20 different chef-curated meal options every week, and you can even customize meals by swapping out types of protein or going for vegetarian-friendly options. And if your schedule gets hectic, Home Chef also has extra quick solutions like their 15-minute recipes, microwave meals, and oven-ready options. Of the recipes we tried, the tilapia coated with tempura mix was truly one of the best fish fry I've ever had. And the roasted broccoli with honey mustard dressing had my daughter asking for more. And she doesn't even like broccoli. For a limited time only, go to homechef.com slash birthfall for 16 free meals. Again, go to homechef.com slash birthfall for 16 free meals. The mortality rate is horrible all across the board. I think the U.S. right now ranks as 54 in um, for high resource countries. And then, if you are a black person, then you have higher risk of of dying from giving Mm -hmm. labor. So we are spending almost as much, uh, uh, twice as much money as anybody else in our healthcare system, in our prayer natal systems, and we're having some of the worst outcomes. So just unpacking, like, what does that really mean? And it's not even just maternal mortality. It's what's even worse or the underbelly of it is maternal morbidity, which means um, severe illness in, in pregnancy, in the labor process, in the birth process, in the postpartum process. Something sometimes people call near misses or near deaths, which is just like a chilling term that, people who are sort of at the brink of dying and then brought back. So those numbers are even worse. And and I'm hoping that, 
you know, those of us who are in the work in a different way, maybe in a more academic or clinical way, we're really also starting to think about morbidity, the severe morbidity crisis is, is you know, that means like severe hemorrhage or, or eclampsia or, or, or things that we have the tools and the resources and the technology to avert those things. And we're still doing worse than other countries on, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of those markers. And to me, it's also the deeper spiritual root of that is what is the collective consciousness and commitment of this country to families, to parents, to mothers, to women? I don't see that there is a deep collective commitment to that, even though that is the building block of any community. That is the building block of family is to me square one, piece one of a building block of how do you create and grow and sustain healthy communities. Communities make up towns, communities make up cities, they make up states, they make up our country. And we're we're failing. We're, we're failing families and parents and mothers and fathers and grandparents and aunties. I mean, they're being failed left and right. Well, and we know that however a person is born into parenthood, that that dictates, sets the tone of how they will parent. What happens during the birth sets the tone of how you will parent. And it sets the tone of how that little person, that baby, will grow up. Your postpartum experience is going to be very, very impacted by how you birth. And how you birth is going to be impacted of how you're taken care of during pregnancy and so forth. And we can go all the way back. But back to the system. Yes. <laughs> I totally went off on a tangent here. <laughs> Me too. Back to the system. Um, and power. We, I want to talk about power. I challenge my students to and the collaborators to view all of these issues and challenges um, and tensions through a power lens that was shaped for me by Black feminist thinkers, Chicana thinkers, Indian feminist thinkers that, you know, their lives were dictated by so much more clearly by power structures and power systems because they were so excluded from them that they could see them more clearly. When you're in it, you can't really see it, you know? And I don't believe institutions have souls. So let's Let's make that really clear. Institutions are soulless. They are not. We should really refrain from humanizing them because they are not human. Um, So they're not really going to care for you. They're not going to love you. They're not going to protect you. They're not going to... I mean, they have mandates to do no harm. But to me, that's like the bare minimum of what somebody can do is not harm you. Um, And I think the healthcare experience has to be about... It has to be way beyond not harm you. To me, it has to be, we will enhance you. We will make you more whole. We will try. We will not break you more, you know? We're all, I think we're waking up, we're naming the thing, and we're trying to figure out how to reinvent the system. But while we wait for that to happen, for that pregnant person that I mentioned at the beginning that is walking into a hospital to give birth, what are some things they can do to balance out the power towards themselves a little bit? Like, how do they do that work? Hmm. Yeah, I, I I struggle with this question a lot because I I feel like we have to demand more of the system. Like that's number one, right? Um, and I, in some ways, I feel like it's unfair to ask a solitary person to be their only advocate, or a person and their doula, or a person and their partner, or the person and their grandma, whoever that might be, to take on this sort of massive system and say, you figure it out and you advocate for yourself. But I do think that there, if the system is going to treat us like a customer, then we should act like a consumer, right? And so that means doing the research, um, finding out what's available in your community. Know that if you choose care and you have an option to choose midwifery care and it's supported um, by your insurer, And if it's not, you know, that, again, is a whole other sort of conversation that you could have with your insurance. Say, I want this and I demand this of my care. And I know that this is cost savings. And here's the research on how much midwifery care is going to save your company in costs. Um, Because we know that the midwifery, midwifery care is relationally based. So it's a relationship centered model of care. So the care itself is rooted on building the 
trust between you and the midwife or the midwives, depending on what that practice looks like. Um, And that's something we call continuity of care in the jargon is sort of you have this person that over time, because pregnancy is a process, you have this person that you're building this relationship with over time so that they get to learn not just what you tell them, but, you know, just what you bring to your care. Because again, that's going to change on every visit, what you're going through, who's important to you, what what values you realize about yourself. The trust builds, that's really important. Your sense of autonomy will build, where you feel like because your provider trusts you, you're going to feel like, oh, I can tell them what it is that I really want for myself or what I hope for myself well, in this experience. And I think it's really important for them to be clear, to say, take a step back and be clear on what it is they want for themselves and what even more of what they want, what they need. And so, for example, and, and this is I, something I work with my doula clients so much on is do the work of examining where you're at because that's what you're bringing into your birth. And then what do you need to support and help you through that? So, for example, if you've had if experienced trauma in your life, you need a provider that's trauma-informed. If you are a people pleaser, you need to figure out how to strengthen yourself to be able to speak up. And, and, and here we are, you, Mimi, and I, giving everybody who's listening permission to say no, permission to ask the doctor if they can call that doctor by their name instead of Dr. So-and-so. Because back to the hierarchy, midwives are Mimi. You're not midwife Niles. You're Mimi. And the nurses, they're Karen. Like, that it's, shows you the structure of the power. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I mean, you know, not to be super crass here, but this person's going to have their hand in your vagina. You know, like the most intimate thing is going to happen in a way that demand, like you get to make you give consent. And I, I think that is a is a phrase that you need to wire into yourself. You don't have my consent. Say say that and learn that. Look in the mirror and practice it, you know, whatever kind of technique, write it down 25 times every day. You have my consent. You don't have my consent, you know, um, because that's the language of the hospital is about consent. And we are seeing more and more experience of people who are having non-consented care, you know, what the hospital calls refusal of care, is actually people telling you, I don't give you my consent. You don't, this basically means you don't have my permission to do this, you know, and, and, you know, and it can be small. It can be like releasing the membranes and you say, you you don't have my consent unless, you know, you want to have a really good conversation with me about why this might be needed or why this might be beneficial to the the labor and birth of my child, like you don't just get to do it and pop and oh, your water, you know, I released your waters. No, that's not how this works, you know, or so get that part of your vocabulary going. And and again, absolutely, Adriana, you have my permission and you have my support and you have my, all the generations of Indian women behind me telling you, you can do this. And this is, it's your body and it's your choice. And you have autonomy because there are people who don't have that, right? I mean, that's happening right now in this country, but people, their their wombs were taken away from them without them knowing. You know, that is the extreme it of is what horrendous. could happen, but it happens on the micro level to us. On The po- potential of it happens on a micro level of every care episode, of every care experience because of the power dynamic, exactly what Adriana is saying. It's the power dynamic that allows it to happen. And again, if they're going to treat you like a customer, if they're going to treat you like a bottom line, then you treat them like they're giving you a service. You know, I mean, if that's what it demands, even in the public system, and I, I guarantee you I'm 45 years old and there's things about myself I thought I knew that were solid that are not so solid. You know, I don't even know if it's about knowing exactly who I am, but it's knowing what my process is and knowing, you know, how I am in certain situations. And what am I like when I feel intimidated? What am I like when I feel like someone's more powerful than me? Or what am I like when I feel less than or invisible? Those are more important than 
I'm going to take a stand because that's not, I'm not wired that way. You know, I've never been that way as a person. So that's the deeper knowing of like, what is this going to look like? Because we know for a fact that certain things are going to be challenged. You're, you're going to be challenged in, in certain ways. Yeah. And we also know that when you're giving birth, you're in a more vulnerable state. So unfortunately, it's when you're walking into the hospital, that's too late to do the work like we know you and I know that the work needs to be done like you were saying even before you're pregnant but having this consumer approach to it from the first contact and if something's not working fire and rehire right like how yeah. hard it's super yeah. hard work I get it it's hard um yeah, it's hard but or, or you need to have relationships you can trust and if you're not building those relationships that if you feel less than when you're in the presence of your provider I mean, the system, like you said, is already rigged to make you feel that way because the power yeah. is given to not you. Um, <laughs> so even make sure you bring in somebody. Bring in, uh, like, I, as a doula, I have witnessed the room change and what is being said when I walk in. And that's horrible to say because it shouldn't be. But it does. So and it's, it doesn't have to be a doula. It can be, you know, a, your partner, your a family member, a friend. Um, but arm yourself with numbers, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I also tell people to choose wisely who you bring. Um, it's not a show. It's not a sporting event. You know, it is a super sacred time. And I want to say something to, you know, you said it's a very vulnerable time, but it's a weird thing because it's very vulnerable, but probably some of the most power that you'll ever experience in yourself. So it's both these things where you feel super raw because you almost have to, to have this kind of, to eject a human being from your body is super, you're literally very vulnerable, but you're also in one of the most physically powerful, I would say spiritually powerful places that you could be. So I think it's a both and, it's not an either or. Agreed. It's, um, I really see people struggle with both things. And I think a lot of times the media has done us dirty in terms of like what people are like when they're laboring and they become these like raving lunatic people. And yeah, if that's what you are in real life, that's what you're going to be, you know, <laughs> like that might be heightened. But I, I mean, I'm in the hundreds and hundreds, eight hundreds, teetering up to a thousand births. And I have, I can count on one hand when I have seen someone just really just be so far off like off their baseline and usually it's related to like you said before like some trauma is triggered or or something like that happens um but you know like that advice of it's like it's not like falling in love but i tell people it's that feeling of falling in love where you you know when you meet someone and you're like they're so cool you know <laughs> like i really like them i don't know why but you know, I just like, I think I could vibe with them. And that's about intuition too, I think, which is another part of our sacred selves that we've really kind of squashed and numbed and kind of distrusted, especially I think people who identify as women have been told that's not a legitimate form of knowledge. So don't do that. Right. I know I was told that I have very strong intuition, but was told like, where's the evidence for that? I grew up with scientists in my home. Like, what's the evidence for that feeling that you have? And the world will do that to you. And it's really, if you have a strong intuition, like grow it, build it, because you're going to need it as a parent too. And and your intuition is also heightened yeah. during that pregnancy and birth state. Because to me, so the tagline for the podcast is inform your intuition. Ah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and so and you didn't we're tell all me to about... say that, so. <laughs> no, I did not. It's inform your intuition because to me, intuition is other ways of knowing, is ways of knowing that aren't centered around your thinking brain. But all of those other parts of you are as powerful as that thinking brain. We just don't give it as much, you know, stage presence. Yeah. yeah. And I think that our so our culture is designed to delegitim like really delegitimize it. So if you had to pick one thing that people need to do for themselves, what would that be? I do think that it is our collective responsibility as childbearing people in the United States to learn the history of childbearing in the United States and what, what the medical system 
the experimentation and the violence that was done on enslaved women and how that's the roots of those are the roots of modern gynecology and obstetrics. And, you know, I couldn't have said that two years ago without fear of offending physicians or the obstetricians that I love and adore and I work with and respect and admire who themselves don't know the history of their own profession. I mean, to me, those are, you know, you should like, you, you want to get pregnant and somebody should just hand you a, a pile of books or you do the audible or whatever it is not to scare you because that knowledge and information and knowledge and history should not be used for fear. It should be used to empower you to understand the roots of a system that does not protect your autonomy and does not treat you as a sovereign person, right? Who, who gets to make decisions about themselves. And so I would say like reacclimate yourself of childbearing as actually being a site and a location for like feminist principles. Like how do you enact feminist principles in your healthcare? Because now I feel like it's cool to be a feminist, um, but it's so much more than a t-shirt. It's about in, in any time you engage with a system, can you look and analyze that system and demand that system to treat you like a whole, full human being? Um, so that's what I would want for people to do is really learn about what that his, the history is of this in this country, because it is violent and upsetting and, and so deeply disturbing. It will also help you understand what the experience is for Black women and black femmes and black childbearing people in this country. It, it's really something to understand and, and develop deep sort of fierce compassion around that. And the other thing I would tell people too is like stay curious in the work because, you know, pregnancy is one thing, but so is parenting. And to me, this is all a continuum. You know, I feel like some of the first decisions I had to make as a parent was who my provider was and how I was going to labor and birth. Those are decisions that you make for your child, you know? So start thinking of it that way. Um, decisions that you're making for the health of your child and you're not just your own and that people should know that labor and pregnancy and birth and parenting, it's, it's a dance. It's a dyad. Like you're in it with somebody else, right? Even if there's nobody else in that labor room with you, there is another human being who's, who's waiting for your support and your guidance um, through the world. Mimi, thank you so, so much for this fun, fabulous talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Adriana. And I, I really appreciate being invited on. Power to the people. That was Dr. Mimi Niles. Mimi is the only appointed midwife to sit on the New York City Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee. And she also serves on the board of directors of the National Association of Certified Professional Midwives and the New York Birth Center Association. You can find Mimi on Twitter at me underscore Niles. That's M-I underscore N-I-L-E-S. I hope your main takeaway from our conversation is that it is vital for you to understand the context and nuances of the system where you will give birth because they will impact your experience and affect how you will be treated. To that end, Mimi suggested a few books on the history of childbearing in the United States. They are Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington, Killing the Black Body by Dorothy Roberts, and Medical Bondage by Dietrich Cooper Owens. You can connect with us at Birthful Podcast on Instagram. In fact, if you're not driving, it would be lovely if you would take a screenshot of this episode right now and post it to Instagram sharing your biggest takeaway from the episode. Make sure to tag at Birthful Podcast so we can see it and amplify it. You can find the in-depth show notes and transcript of this episode at birthful.com, where you can also learn more about my small birth preparation classes and download your free postpartum preparation plan. Birthful is created and produced by me, Adriana Lozada, with production assistance from Asia Plotty. This episode was produced in part by LWC Studios, Paulina Velasco, Virginia Lora, and Cedric Wilson, with contributions from Kat Hernandez and Ronald Young Jr. Thank you for listening to and sharing Birthful. Be sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and everywhere you listen. Come back for more ways to inform your intuition. <laughs>